Hello there, I'm Ashish Khanna for the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Today I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with Dr. Scott Siegel. Dr. Siegel is Professor and Chair, Department of Anesthesiology at the Wake Forest School of Medicine and the Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. In these difficult times with the coronavirus pandemic, where personal protective equipment is at short supply, homemade masks are being extensively utilized both within and outside the medical community. So if I did not have sophisticated filtration equipment and particle measurement equipment, and I was someone at home making these masks, would you have any guidance for me? So that's the hard part, right? We in the medical industry are so used to getting detailed technical specifications for everything we touch. And that's really not true in the consumer fabric industry. It might be true in production fabric industries, but the average person making their own mask is not going to be able to get detailed technical specs of the fabric that they're using. So we came up with a few rules of thumb. So first let me say that fabrics differed wildly across the spectrum. We had some of our cloth masks that actually outperformed traditional surgical masks. Not N95s, but regular surgical masks. Just to give you some perspective, an N95 filters by definition more than 95% of the smallest particles. And in our testing, they did. So we think our testing methodology is reasonable. Um, surgical masks, about 62 to 65% of the smallest particles, the 0.3 micron particles. And cloth masks, some of our best ones filtered 77 to 79%. And some of the poorest performers were 20% or less. One was 1%. So they're so different. We thought we have to be able to give the public some guidance. And here's the best we can do. Take the fabric, hold it up to a bright light or to the sun. And if you can see the light outlining the individual fibers in the weave of the fabric, it's probably a relatively poorer filter. And if you can't see that, it's probably a better filter. And the better filtration grade cloths tended to be what sewing people would call quilting cotton. It's a heavier, denser weave, usually of thicker yarns. Batik is apparently particularly good in this regard. Um, whereas the sort of stuff you can get at a big box discount fabric store that's a simple printed cotton fabric did not perform as well. Two layers were better than one in our hands. And when looking at a high performing mask, adding various filters, coffee filters, microfiber cloth, various other materials like that did not seem to improve the filtration efficacy. We have not tested those materials in poor performing masks to see if they might improve the performance. And lots of people are trying different things to insert into a cloth mask. But that's the best guidance that, that we can offer to the public. And uh, also, I guess I should add that flannel also is a very good filter. So you can make a mask out of a less, uh, a, a lower grade cotton outer layer and a fabric uh, uh, flannel. We'll start at that again. So you could also make a mask out of a lower grade printed cotton material as an outer layer and a flannel inner layer. Now I should point out, we healthcare workers are used to wearing masks. We know what they feel like. The general public doesn't know what they feel like. They're uncomfortable, especially if they're fit well. Right. Um, and, these, and these cotton masks, particularly the flannel ones, are quite warm. We're right. used to a pretty well ventilated mask that we Right. wear day-to-day -day in our clinical operations. In fact, I have great respect for these paper masks now, just how high-tech they actually are. But people should realize these are not going to be as comfortable as the masks you're used to wearing around the hospital all day. Right. It takes them getting used to. The one last thing I would add is we think the tie-on design is better than the ear loop design because it offers a more custom fit to the face. Everybody's face, my actual research most of the time is on facial structure and airway difficulty. Um, everybody's face is different. The size, the shape, the curves of the face are different and a tie-on design allows a more custom fit. So we would recommend that if possible. Sure, so, so it looks like there are some variables here, right? Um, the breathability of the mask and the comfort of the mask versus the, the mask actually doing its job, right? And, and, and I guess some of the questions would be, well, if I was not a doctor, would I really know how to tie a mask properly in the back of my head? Would I just prefer the going over the ears kind of design? But I guess, you know, 
we never anticipated that as you know people walking out on the street we'd have to wear masks right so these are unprecedented times and people will have to learn um, there's lots of guidance online there's plenty of, of, of videos that you can watch uh, on YouTube and elsewhere that show how to tie the mask on properly and how to how to wear it properly and I, I don't think it takes that much effort to learn how to do that as I've moved around uh, from time to time uh, out in our city I see people with tie on masks. I think they're getting the hang of it. Right. I, I would say breathability really, really matters. And I think people may mistakenly think that just because the fabric blocks lots of particles that it makes a great mask. If you can't breathe through it, you're just gonna be breathing around it. And that's not gonna help anyone, uh, right. including yourself. Right. So yeah, hold it up to your mouth and nose, I would tell the public. Uh, not for one or two breaths, but for two minutes and make sure you can breathe comfortably with it closely applied to your nose and mouth. Um, you know, some cultures are really used to wearing masks out in public and that has not been the case here in the United States. And, and so I think it's novel for us and uh, people are hungry for information on how they can make a mask that will best uh, protect them and others. And I'm grateful for that. Uh, that was the reason why we decided to try to release some of our preliminary results in this format as a, as a press release, rather than wait for a traditional scholarly publication, just because right now people need to have some guidance. And I'm pleased that the, 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 the general public media and the public appears to be interested in getting it right. Sure, and then, you know, again, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but looks like there was data coming back from some of the, uh, Southeast Asian, South Asian countries where they generally showed that, you know, people who were wearing masks, you know, starting January when, when the, the news first started coming up, those countries didn't have as much of a community spread than, than here. So maybe there is some value to just protecting yourself. And, and, and again, you know, we've come to that point that in the next, you know, whatever time we we'll think of coming back out and being social again, I'm sure people are still at least some of us are worried and would still want to protect ourselves and protect others, right? So, I mean, this might be just a good way to sort of come back to the real world. Well, every single day is a natural experiment in um, viral pandemic uh, mm -hmm. uh, physiology and epidemiology. And so I have no doubt that someone will figure out a way to estimate mask wearing in public versus um, the are not for the virus in those in those environments and there will be publications I'm sure coming in that regard um, You know, I do think that one of the dimensions of this that really was only discovered in the months since it became a worldwide phenomenon is just how much asymptomatic infection there is and it may very well be that cultures that were used to wearing some sort of face covering more frequently in public were able to limit some of the asymptomatic transmission between individuals in the community in a way that certain other cultures didn't. And I agree with you, we'll, we'll learn something about that. I, I find it, there's very little to lose uh, to wear a mask. And in my view, if you have a choice of materials, there's very little to, you, to lose to try to use the most effective material you can put your hands on. Um, thank you for sharing your time and experiences with us today. I'm sure the medical fraternity at the SCCM and outside the SCCM would is really going to appreciate all of this work, especially because it's so applicable to everyone, whether you're a critical care doctor or not. I mean, all of us, all of us need masks today and need to be innovative, but yet still be scientific in the way we approach the mask problem. Yeah, I, I'll say I found it, I, I continue to find it very inspiring how much uh, experimentation and creativity uh, our community in general has been applying to this problem. Um, many of us in, in your society are anesthesiologists, some are from other fields for sure. We tend to be tinkerers. Uh, we love to MacGyver together uh, various things and, and people have been incredibly creative in the different ideas they've come up with and if we can hold on to the few good things that come out of this crisis, that spirit of innovation and trying to solve problems creatively is something that I hope that we will hold on to. And I appreciate your interest in what we've been doing uh, here at Wake Forest.